Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day. It's time to sing your song again Whatever may pass And whatever lies before me Let me be singing when the evening comes Bless the Lord, O oh my soul O oh my soul Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find To bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul Worship His holy name Sing like never before I'll worship your holy name And on that day when my strength is failing The end draws near and my time has come Still my soul will sing your praise unending thousand years and then forevermore. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. I'll worship Your holy name. Worship your holy name. Good morning. Uh, I'm excited to worship with you and want to connect with you. I'm in the youth room, our uh, high school classroom, and uh, I know, like many of you, maybe we're, it's a broken record, but missing you, and I know we're missing being connected face to face um, uh, in the same room and same space, but. Uh, even so, we're going to just urge you to fill out the connect card and uh, help us. There's, you can click the link there, members and guests alike. We would love to hear from you. Uh, there's a special place at the bottom where you can send us a note, a request, or uh, just tell us how good we're doing. You know, uh, I'm kidding, but just a place we want to know from, hear from you and see you. Um, send us a pictures, and, and while we're getting ready, just comment and, and say hello to everybody. And so we, we just want to uh, start being uh, connected and uh, together. But I'm excited to worship with you, and just want to remind you also about all the great resources we have, and, and all the works that are going on in uh, our ladies' class and our Bible hour, and the work Tyler is doing and keeping his class connected. And you can go back and and see some of those things even from the past. One of the blessings of all all this uh, stuff, but our classes and, and those things. So we have a lot going on and we hope that you'll uh, take advantage of those things as um, we have opportunity. So uh, as we're preparing to worship, 
I hope that you will uh, be preparing your mind as you're getting things ready, uh, singing along with the songs that are playing or tuning into the announcements that are coming across the screen and all the things you're doing. I want to read you a passage from Hebrews chapter 12 as we begin preparing our hearts for worship. This is when uh, Jesus or the Hebrew writer is talking about Jesus as our mediator, as our connection to heaven. And the very next thing he says in verse 25 is, see that you do not refuse him who's speaking for if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens. This phrase yet once more indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, that have been made in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. What a blessing we have through Christ uh, to worship together. And I hope that you're getting excited because I am to, to worship this morning. God bless you. I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. And the little light from heaven filled my soul. Jesus, tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faintest cry, I'll answer by and by. I feel a little prayerful yearning, as your heart into heaven is turning. You will find a little talk with Jesus, makes it right, it makes it right. Sometimes my past seems drear, without a ray of cheer. And then a cloud of doubt may hide the light of day. Sin may rise and hide the starry skies, but just a little talk with Jesus clears away. Now let us have, have a little talk with Jesus. Let us tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faintest cry. Answer by and by. Feel a little prayerful yearning as your heart into heaven is turning. You will find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. It makes it right. I may have doubts and fears, my eyes be filled with tears, but Jesus is the friend who watches day and night. I go to him in prayer, he knows my every care, and just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus, let us tell him all about our troubles, he will hear our faintest cry, answer by and by. Turning, you will find a little talk with Jesus makes it right, it makes it right. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Let us tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faintest cry.
O Ancient of Days. Your kingdom shall reign over all the earth. Sing unto the Ancient of Days, for none can compare to your matchless worth. Sing unto the Ancient of Days, your kingdom shall reign over all the earth. Sing unto the Ancient of Days, for none can compare to your matchless worth. Sing unto the Ancient of Days, every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory, every knee shall bow at your throne. In worship you will be exalted, O God, and your kingdom shall not pass away, O Ancient of Days. O Ancient of Days, O Ancient of Days, O Ancient of Days, O Ancient of Days. I'm gonna trade my earthly home for a better one, bright and fair. Christ left to prepare a mansion for his children in the air. I'll join him in that land where tears, no sorrow can be found. And I'll receive my mansion, mansion, robe, robe and crown. The weather there is always fair, there is sunshine day and night. No cold and no rain will fall there, for the sun shines ever bright. I'll need no heavy garments, I'll just wrap my robe around When I receive my mansion, mansion robe, robe and crown Mansion, mansion robe and a crown Glory, There love, love will always abound Let me your throne surround Lord, please reserve my mansion, mansion robe, robe and crown my head is bowed and bloody now from the work I've tried to do. But one day I'll be rewarded with a crown so bright and new. I'll wear a smile so bright for there'll be no cause for a frown. When I receive my mansion, mansion robe, robe and crown. I want a mansion, mansion, mansion robe and a crown. And glory there I know and love and always abound. Around. Lord, please reserve my mansion, mansion robe, robe and crown. I want a mansion, mansion, mansion robe and a crown. And glory there, I know that love and always abounds. Let me your throne surround. Lord, please reserve my mansion, mansion robe, robe and crown. Good morning. Welcome to the Worship of the League City Church of Christ online. Uh, my name is Corey Myers. I'm one of the ministers here, and I'm grateful that you are tuning in and are part of our worship together. God bless you. And even though our building is closed, I want to remind you that um, we're still available. Our office is open, and um, I, I'm open, and many others ready to serve you and to help you and so I hope that you won't be uh, bashful about reaching out. If we could pray with you, if we can encourage you, or we could just see you and talk to you. Uh, I know we're missing and, and anxious to be back together. So um, as we're preparing and as we're opening our worship, I want to remind you also about our word search and some ways that you can connect, especially for our children to do uh, connect to the message. And so that will be a blessing to you if you choose to, to use that. So as we enter into this worship together, would you pray with me? Our Father, we love you. Um, you are in heaven, you're wise, you are all-knowing, all-giving. We just ask, dear God, that you give us uh, a greater faith in you and trust in you because uh, you know the things that are going on in our world, uh, the things that are going on in our own worlds, in our own lives, in our own families, and you have a plan. And... Um, we're grateful that we can be a part of that plan and why 
There may be chaos. There may be different things going on around us. You've, you've given us something that can't be shaken. And one of those great blessings is the church and, and a spiritual family that you've given us here and a good one. And so we are grateful. We're blessed. And we are looking forward to worshiping you in spirit and truth. And we just ask that you uh, take away those barriers, perhaps if that's possible, and open our hearts, Father, this morning as we enter into this time together. Uh, we praise you and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Blessed be your name in a land that is plentiful, where streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name, when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. On a road marked with suffering, though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away, you give and take away, my heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away, you give and take away, my heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Every time I kneel to pray, I open up my heart to my Lord. Every time I kneel to pray, I open up my heart to my Lord. Every time I close my eyes, I feel the sweet embrace of my Lord. Every time I close my eyes, I feel the
the sweet embrace of my Lord. I don't know why so many things seem to get in the way of seeing my God's glory. But I try every day to see Him and to thank Him for all the things He's given me. Every time I see a child, I see the gentleness of my Lord. Every time I see a child, I see the gentleness of my Lord. Every time I watch a storm, I know the awesome power of my Lord. Every time I watch a storm, I know the awesome power of my Lord. I don't know why so many things seem to get in the way of seeing my God's glory. But I try every day see him and to thank him for all the things he's given me. Every time I see the cross. Good morning, church. We've come to the point in our worship this morning for the Lord's Supper. We have reference to do this in Acts chapter 20, verse 7. In addition, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26, we read, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So along with having reference to do this, what we also have is an amazing opportunity. An opportunity, even though we're apart right now, to come together as a Christian family, clear our minds, and truly reflect on the incredible sacrifice that took place on our behalf so that we might have the hope of eternity in heaven one day. Let's pray. Lord, as we reflect on the sacrifice of your Son and partake of this bread that represents his broken body, we pray that we will do so in a manner that is pleasing in your sight. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's pray for the cup. Lord, we pray your blessing over this fruit of the vine that represents the blood shed on the cross and the sacrifice made for the forgiveness of our sins. We pray we take it in a manner that's pleasing in your sight. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
How beautiful the hands that serve the wine and the bread and the sons of the earth. How beautiful the feet that walked the long dusty roads and the hill to the cross. How beautiful. We now have an opportunity to give back a portion of the funds the Lord has blessed us with for the works of the church. We have Bible reference to do this in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6-7, through 7, which reads, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Let's pray. Lord, we have so much to be thankful for in our lives, and we pray that as we now have this opportunity to return a portion of the funds we've been blessed with, that we will do so in a right mind and with a cheerful heart. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Bless the Lord, O my soul, and let all that is within me bless his holy name. Well, I hope this finds you doing well and abounding in the grace of God on this Lord's Day. Since we've been recording these sessions, and I've been recording my Bible class as well, before my Bible class, since uh, we, I don't have people actually present in the room, I've been encouraging viewers to make sure that they have a, a delicious, chemically laced, artificially sweetened, carbonated beverage at hand, or just at least some refreshing beverage. And that's one of the luxuries of having this sort of setup. And maybe right now, maybe even you have a cup of coffee nearby, perhaps, or even a, just a, a glass of water, a bottle of water, whatever the case might be. And you might take a sip of that occasionally, and it might feel refreshing. John, right now, out of the corner of my eye, who's running things here in our little studio, he just took a sip of uh, his coffee. If I get if I get thirsty, I'll have you bring it bring it to me. <laughs> but uh, that that I'm sure is refreshing. It does uh, feel good when you're thirsty to have something like that. But I'm sure you understand how if you're totally parched. Having a drink is just an incredible experience. Well, think of being out in the wilderness in a place where there is no water and being thirsty and in desperate need for something to drink. Now, I've never been in a situation like that, but maybe we can think of what that would be like and how it would just sort of take over your whole being, that longing to quench your thirst. Well, I'm saying that because I want to look at a psalm with you today. And the setting for this psalm is apparently when David was out in the Judean wilderness. And likely that wilderness looked like what you're seeing right now. Uh, this uh, image here with uh, some hills and mountains in the distance, not much vegetation. And you can see, wow, what, a, what, a, what an arid place that would be. Well, that psalm that I'm talking about with this setting is Psalm 63, and it's one of my favorites, and it's one that I have studied and read. In fact, that I've preached on before here at League City. I think it was on a Sunday night some time ago, maybe a couple years ago now, that I did a, a lesson on it. It was a different lesson with different major points, and I decided to take a, another look at it, and I think it will be evident to you why. And the reason that I say that this was uh, one that is a, a situation where David is out in the wilderness is because you see that in the heading of the psalm. If you look in your Bible, you'll see before many of the psalms some type of inscription, some type of heading. And the one for Psalm 63 says, A Psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. And it appears that this was when he had to flee and was on the run from Saul. Uh, or perhaps it may have been when he was king and was on the run from Absalom. But it's more likely that uh, this is when he was out. It's my understanding anyway from my study. Uh, fleeing from Saul, but whatever the case might be, I want you to think of this idea of being in the wilderness. Now, those inscriptions are not part of the inspired text, but they are very ancient, and they're generally thought to be reliable. And so I think that setting is important to keep in mind when we look at the psalm. It's evident that you have someone here expressing uh, thirst, and he's speaking uh, metaphorically, of course. But how it can be relevant to us is there are times when we feel that we're maybe in the wilderness spiritually, where we feel that we're away from God or maybe going through a dry period in our spiritual lives. And it's evident when you see what David says in this psalm that he felt like he was away from God. We know God is omnipresent, that the Lord is everywhere. 
but he felt separated from Jerusalem and from the sanctuary where God's special presence was located. And he certainly, in, out in the wilderness, was away from the people of God. Well, that's, that's our situation right now, isn't it? I mean, we are away from each other. And it has been that way for weeks now. And so I hope you see that's why I chose to return to this psalm and take another look at it. I really wish that you would try to make it your own personal prayer. I've prayed this psalm. I decided to choose this one that I've prayed many times in the past. But when the corona quarantine, I guess we can call it, when that began, I decided to do my best to read through this psalm at least once a day through this entire period that we've been going through and to pray it to the Lord, to go through the text and pray it to the Lord. It's not just something that concerned David. We know that uh, David's experiences and the experiences of the psalmist were intended to be universal so that, so that we could look into them and see our own experiences, our own longings, our own laments, our own praises. Let's make this our own as we begin to look at it today. Now, this is just part one. Lord willing, we're going to continue to look at this in a second lesson, but we're going to begin it today in a lesson that I'm calling Thirsting for God. So there's your title and you know what to do, right? Those of you taking notes, Write that down at the top of the page. We like to have a title. I think it helps us structure things and helps embed the lesson a little bit more in our minds. So that's what I want you to write down. And if you're not writing on paper, well, you certainly can see it there before you. I hope that helps. And the points we're going to be looking at are seeking. And then we're going to see the sanctuary. And then David's reference to God's steadfast love. So first of all, this idea of seeking. Let's look at the first verse. And this is the ESV that I'm using right here. In Psalm 63, in verse 1, David says, Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Now, I'm highlighting that first statement. Oh, God, you are my God. And that's the beginning of a song that we sing based upon this psalm and other psalms like it. But I want you to think about, first of all, you see, I have the word God, the first word God in red, and that's Elohim in the Hebrew text. But it appears that in this psalm and other psalms in this particular section of the Psalter, it appears that there were references to the personal name of God, the Hebrew tetragrammaton that is Jehovah in older translations like the ASV, uh, Yahweh or Yahweh as it is sometimes pronounced and is in newer translations generally as the Lord in all capital letters that there are places where that personal name of God is used Yah Yahweh and instead of putting it into the text, the transcriber changed it to Elohim out of a, a, a reverence for not pronouncing a reverence for God that wanted to avoid perhaps mispronouncing or irreverent, irreverently uh, pronouncing the name of God. That instead of seeing Yahweh, we have the word Elohim, we have God. But if it was Yahweh, that makes more sense that he's saying, Oh, Yahweh, you are my God, Elohim. Oh, Yahweh, see, you, the personal name of God here, that you, the God of my fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that you, notice I'm, I'm highlighting that term, you here. He's saying now there are pagan peoples around us and they have their gods. But Yahweh, you, you are my God. Notice, for example, in verse four, he says, in your name, in your name, I will lift up my hands. And then in verse 11, at the end of the psalm, he refers to those who swear by your name. So it's you, you are 
my God. I like that, that he makes it very personal. This shows a longing here that seems to be intensely personal, that David is speaking to God, not just about God, and he's calling on God and he's saying, you, you are mine. Other people may have other gods. They have these other deities that they call on, that they swear by, whom they praise. But Yahweh, you, you are mine. You are my God. Now, just look at that statement for a minute and think about your own life. Is God truly your God? I often speak of the problem of idolatry or having idols in our lives that can supplant God, that can push God out of the place that, that he ought to have in our lives. Is there something that is pushing God out of the rightful place that he ought to have in, in your life? Is it someone, something, anything, anything? that is interfering with your complete devotion to God. And when I pray this psalm, a lot of times I stop here and say, Lord, I want you and you alone to be my God, not something else. And if there is some idol in the corner of my heart that I don't see, that I'm blind to, uh, that I'm hiding there, please help me remove it so that you, Lord, so that you are my God. All right, let's go on then. Notice he says, Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly, earnestly, I seek you. So notice uh, this is a time in his life where he, he's not showing a casual interest in, in God. You know, a lot of times we find people with sort of a half hearted interest in the Lord or in the things of God. And maybe in a time of trouble, they uh, start to show a little bit more interest. They seem to be seeking, but but our seeking has to be wholehearted. It has to be with all of our hearts. This is the kind of seeking that we're seeing here with David. Earnestly, I seek you. Earnestly. And look at the, the language as you continue. He says, my soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. Like, like falling out as you're striving to make your way through the wilderness and you feel like you're dying of this thirst, the pain from this thirst. There's an aching there. David said, that's what I'm feeling in my soul. It's as though his whole being, he says, my soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. This is very powerful language to try to convey. He says, it's like in a dry and weary land where there is no water. This is the, the strongest of language to show the kind of aching and the kind of longing that David had for the presence of God. And we find it elsewhere in other Psalms. Like th think of Psalm 42, and we're familiar. This is uh, one that we uh, or this, there are songs that we sing that have the same language from, from other psalms. But notice Psalm 42, as a deer pants for the flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. You, you think of that animal parched out there in a, in a time maybe of um, where in a desolate place when there's no water available, maybe a drought and the tongue is just hanging out and the, there's a panting there's a panting of that creature he said god that's the way that i long for you now why is he thirsting this is where i think you can see this i believe makes this so relevant to you and to me right now given what we're going through in not being able to assemble as we normally would look at this look at it my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Now that's language used with reference to going to Jerusalem at the appointed feast or at the appointed time of worship and going before the sanctuary. That's the idea of going to worship, to appear before God. Now we need to realize God is, is always present. But when we worship, we need to feel this idea that we're coming before God. And that's what he's talking about. And so then he, he goes on to talk about how he, he cries. He, he has these tears 
uh, because of what he's experiencing and and what he's thinking about. Look down in verse four. He says, now these things I remember as I pour out my soul. He says, this is what I'm thinking about. How I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts of songs and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. He said, that's what I remember and that's what I miss. Right now, Lord, when I can't appear before you, when I can't go to worship you in the way that I normally would with God's people, see, that's the, that's why I'm feeling this kind of aching because it, it's this separation and I'm remembering when, when I could do that. Maybe you and I have done that many times over these weeks. You remember, you remember when we used to actually see each other and we all got to see each other and we all got to talk with, e- with each other and just to be together to appear before God. What an experience. And when we don't have it, doesn't it make us appreciate it even more? Doesn't it make you long for it more? That's what you're seeing with David here. Can you see now why this psalm would be so relevant to us right now? I hope so. Now, go back to the text, Psalm 63 and verse 1. He says, my, my soul thirsts for you. That's what I'm highlighting right here. My flesh faints for you. It's not just that, well, I'm in need right now and I need something for you to give me, God. Uh, it's not just be, well, I need a blessing in my health. I need a blessing in my finances. I need something fixed in my family, uh, whatever the case might be. It's Lord, I- I'm, I'm thirsting for you. That's why I said this makes it so personal, intensely personal. It's God himself, the Lord himself that David longs for. So think of this. Uh, he's in the wilderness at this time. He feels away from God. There, there's a feeling of absence from God that we sometimes experience. And then maybe it kindles within us when we realize, I need the Lord, that that we long for his presence anew. It can be, please hear me, please hear me. If you take nothing else from this, I hope this helps you today. That it can be in those difficult treks through the dryness of the wilderness where we feel away from God, that we actually have the opportunity for God to make his presence known and for us to experience anew that the Lord is with us. That those dry periods, those periods in the wilderness They can be the times, the very times when God's presence is longed for and then experienced like nowhere else. And I think you'll see that when we finish the psalm next time. Now, we're not done today, and I am trying to keep an eye on my timer here. So there's the there's the seeking. All right, let's move on where he talks about the sanctuary, the sanctuary. And here. I'm referring to verse two. As he continues, he's thinking back. Notice the past tense I've tried to emphasize slightly there with the word looked. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary. Look at the key terms here I've highlighted. Looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Notice he says you. I've looked upon you in the sanctuary. Now, how did he see God in the sanctuary. He said there's some way, and then those other terms there, there's some way that he saw God's power and God's glory. So since this is likely before the temple of Solomon, here he seems to be alluding to the sanctuary, the tabernacle in which was the Ark of the Covenant where God's special presence was. And this is where the people would gather for worship. And so the the tabernacle, it may be that he's referring to the tabernacle itself, that that, um, if he's not talking about some experience that he had, some revelation from God or a vision that God blessed him with at that time, then it's likely he's thinking about the actual structure of the of the tabernacle itself and the the materials with which it was made and the beauty that it showed 
and that inside there in the Holy of Holies was the, the beautiful Ark of the Covenant. And that when David saw those things, now he couldn't go into the Holy of Holies, but uh, he had seen the Ark and, and when it was transported to Jerusalem, and he, of course, had seen the sanctuary. And those things struck him that they were showing him God himself in some way. That I was beholding you when I saw the sanctuary there, I was seeing your power and your glory. See, that it was intended in the materials of which it was made and in the beauty with which it was constructed. All of that was intended to convey something about God himself. And so he says, I remember when I could see you, when I could see your power and glory represented at the sanctuary. Now, I've got a question. I said all that to ask you this. In what sanctuary has God become present to us where we can look, spiritually speaking, and see, like David says in this psalm, see his power and his glory? Notice I've got that word sanctuary there in quotes because we're going to look at that here. In John 1, let's go to the New Testament now, in the prologue, when John tells us in verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he tells us how God in Jesus Christ became a man. Look down in verse 14, right? Where he says, and the word became flesh and dwelt. And that verb there, dwelt, is, is the verb tabernacled. And, and that's the word for sanctuary. That, in other words, in Christ, God came and sanctuaried, if I can say that, sanctuaried among us. And we have seen his glory. Look at the same terminology that John uses about how God is present in Christ. Remember, Matthew calls him God with us, citing the prophecy from Isaiah 7 there in Matthew chapter 1, verses 21 through 23. So God was present in the person of Jesus Christ. And John says, we saw his glory. That we saw the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ, in the words and the teaching of Jesus Christ, in the miracles of the Lord, in the suffering of the Lord on the cross, properly understood. And we saw in, in his work on the cross and in his passion, we saw the glory of God in Jesus Christ. And we see the power of God in Jesus Christ as well. For example, in Ephesians 1, 19 through 20. There, oh, this is such a great text in verse 18, Paul said he's praying that the, the eyes of their hearts would be enlightened so that they could understand the riches of the glory of the inheritance of the saints that God has given them. But then look at verse 19 where he says, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might. Well, where do we see that power? Where is the working of that great might that, that God is working in us? He says, well, he worked that power, verse 20, uh, when he raised Christ. He worked it in Christ when he raised him from the dead and then seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. So Paul says, among other ways, we see the power of God in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And so when David talks about seeing the glory and the power of God, you can think about how we can see the glory of, and the power of God in Christ and how the New Testament reveals to us God in Jesus Christ and in the gospel of Christ. And then we see it in the church of Christ, that Christ is present in his church. And so you and I don't go to a sanctuary and see the beauty of the tapestries and the colors and the uh, a perfect construction of it to show us the power and glory of God. But when we see the love of God and we see the love of Christ at work in the people of Christ in the church, we're seeing the glory of God. We're seeing the glory of God in Christ in his church. We're seeing the power of God at work in us. So we see that in Christ and in his church, and that should be transformative to us. And we should have that same kind of longing for that and, and, and contemplation of that that you see right here in David. All right. 
We've got to go to our last point. So you see the seeking that he has. You see how he thinks of the sanctuary, but now he makes reference to God's steadfast love. In verses 3 and 4, he says, Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. Now, you know what I'm going to refer to now. Those of you who have heard me preach a lot from the Old Testament and talk about this word translated in the ESV, steadfast love, right? It's that Hebrew term chesed. Chesed, or sometimes just pronounced chesed, or even sometimes you'll see it as chesed uh, with an indication under the H, that it's that hard H sound. But this is, uh, this is the steadfast love of God. Sometimes it's translated loving kindness or mercy. In some Bibles, it is translated covenant love. I've heard it referred to that way or loyal love, but it's the idea of God's faithful love. This is the, the term God used, among others, when he revealed his glory to Moses. You remember in Exodus 34, 6 and 7, one of the most important verses in the, in the Old Testament, where Moses said, Lord, show me your glory, and God hid him in the cleft of the rock, and he passed by it, and that's when he said, the Lord, the Lord, Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and that's when he said, uh, keeping steadfast love. That's that term, abounding in chesed and keeping chesed, keeping steadfast love with, um, with thousands, he goes on to say there. And it's just a powerful, powerful affirmation of this attribute with reference to God. So in other words, David is contemplating God's covenant love, his covenant faithfulness. And as he thinks of that, as he thinks of that, now he's out in the wilderness. Now, he, he may not know whether he's going to live or die, but let's go back to our text. Let's go back to it again. Now, look at carefully because your steadfast love, it's better than, it's better than life itself. My lips will praise you, so I will bless you as long as I live. And I think the idea David is saying here is, I don't know how much longer I have to live. If you're going to intervene, Lord, and if you're going to deliver me from whatever the, whatever the present crisis is, he's saying, I know this, that your steadfast love, it's better than life itself. So that even if I don't live very much longer, my lips are still going to praise you. Even if I have to go through this wilderness and even if I don't make it out of this wilderness, the contemplation of your steadfast love, that means more to me even than life itself. Is that how you feel about God when you think of his faithful love? As long as I live, as long as you give me breath, see, there's there's a commitment there's where David's responding to the steadfast love, saying, I'm going to praise you as long as I live. And then look at the language of praise in the passage. My lips will praise you, and so I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. That, that is a gesture of worship, just like sometimes we bow our heads and fold our hands. We kind of do the opposite to show a posture of focus and reverence. Well, it was common for the Jews to lift up their hands and look upward to focus the attention on God. And he's saying, look, as long as I live, I'm going to praise you, Lord, because of your steadfast love. And so David's longing, David's thirsting for God. What, what a powerful text. I hope this passage moves you. I hope that through it, God speaks to you like I feel that he is speaking spoken to me in a special way. Make this your personal prayer. Think on it. And you're going to see as we finish this, Lord willing, when we do part two, you're going to see how David's longing was satisfied, how that thirst was quenched by the contemplation of God. I'm really looking forward to that and I hope that you are too. But as we think about David now and this love for God and the love of God, that so moved him, I want to ask you, is your soul thirsting for God? You need 
God. And it could be maybe you've been brought out into the wilderness somehow in the providence of God by the hand of God. Maybe something He's caused, maybe something He's allowed in your life that has put you in a place where you realize that you need the Lord. And and if you're thirsting for God, if you're earnestly, isn't that what David says here? If you're earnestly seeking God, we want to help you, please. We're waiting. We want to be the hands of God to help you know Him and experience His steadfast love and His saving love in Christ and in His body, in His church. Contact us and we'd be happy, we would be more than happy to do whatever we need to do to to get with you and make sure you know that you're right with God and that longing is filled. Our dear brother or sister, if you need prayers, if you need encouragement, let us know. Is your soul thirsting for God? Let's think about that and let's use this psalm. May God bless you and keep you. Good morning. My name is Ken Eubanks and I'm one of the six elders here at the League City Church of Christ. I want to thank our associate minister, Corey Myers, for his contribution this morning to the service and for all he's doing with our youth. Thanks to Scott Hickenbotham for leading us in the Lord's Supper, his thoughts and his prayers as we commune this morning. And thanks to John Anderson for the scripture reading. And also a thanks to Tyler Young, our minister, for his message from the Holy Scriptures of Psalm 63 concerning God's care and protection. A special thanks to John Anderson for putting together the video production of the worship service, Bible hour for our younger kids, ladies classes, youth Bible classes, and much more. So thank you, John. Want to thank all of you who are listening in today uh, for joining our worship service. To our visitors, we hope that you enjoyed Tyler's lessons from the scriptures. If you have questions or comments, we would invite you to go to the comment section of our church webpage and leave your comments there. Or if you prefer, please call our church office and leave your number and your questions and we will get back to you. To our members, again, thank you for participating in the online worship service this morning. We thank you for keeping up with one another and for your continued support for our work here uh, during this time of challenge and opportunity. An email was sent out this past week on behalf of the elders communicating our belief that a focus on unity in the body of Christ during a, a very difficult period as this in our history is of great benefit Uh, to the body of Christ. And uh, Romans, the 14th and 15th chapters were the basis for some of that uh, note. The email was, it also mentioned reopening Sunday morning worship assembly. In that regard, we are scheduling for Sunday morning worship assembly to begin again on June 21st. As mentioned, there are details to be worked out. Members who will be asked to help execute the plan and above all, cooperation from all of us will be needed for reopening the worship services. We understand our members and visitors may have questions. To help answer your questions, emails will be sent out this week and you will hear more details from one of our elders at the closing of the worship service on June 14th. For those not able to attend, live streaming of the worship service will be provided. For communion, I know there's been a number of questions for those that we have talked with uh, and called, and we appreciate everyone's feedback in that regard on spacing, on social distancing, on wearing masks, but but I wanted to mention one 
simple one this morning, which is of concern, is the uh, how we're going to do communion with the the loaf and the the fruit of the vine. If you'll notice, um, these are self-contained uh, communion packets, and they're in a, a sandwich bag that's sealed. And uh, you'll be receiving that uh, if you partaking of communion when you arrive at assembly on June 21st. And if you have questions concerning the particulars, please uh, call the office or contact one of one of the elders or, or others. At this time, I would like to lead us in a closing prayer, so please pray with me. Almighty God, we praise your name this morning. We come before you uh, thanking you for all things that you provide us, the blessings of this life and uh, the strength and the endurance uh, to weather these very difficult times. And dear God, we know that you hold not only our future, but you hold us in your hand and um, you care for us. Lord, we uh, thank you for the many things that we we have materially, uh, we're mindful of those who have lost their jobs and are suffering um, financially. And dear Lord, we ask a special prayer this morning that they may regain employment, that their finances may be improved and things may work well for them going forward. But we know there are, is distress and there is concern about the future. And we know, again, you hold the future. And so let us put our faith in you and um, for you will not forsake us. Dear Lord, we continue to ask you to protect us from the harm during this pandemic. We're mindful, especially of three of our members, our, our loved ones of families here at the congregation, but for our brother Ray Vermillion, and his wife Barbara and their family. Dear God, we ask for healing for Ray and as we know he is going through a different, difficult medical time and for also Ron Bonner who is having issues with uh, heart and kidneys and fluid. Dear God, we ask for healing for him as well. For Christina Riggins, for Barry and Lucy's daughter who's uh, has been suffering with cancer and it looks like cancer may have uh, uh, reappeared. Dear God, we ask that uh, the treatment that the doctors provide will be effective in uh, um, ridding, ridding her of any cancer that may have reoccurred. Lord, we ask you to bless us as we look to again assemble as a body. And we pray for those that uh, may not be able to attend, uh, at least initially, on June 21st. Um, dear God, help us to uh, plan and to work the details. And we, we look forward to seeing each other again, even though it will be different than what we had uh, in early March of this year. Uh, dear God, we uh, ask for forgiveness of sin in our lives. And dear God, we ask all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus, our Lord. Amen.
filled with grace, faithful love, endless power, living flames, spirits fire, burning bright in the night, guiding my way. Faithful Hosanna in the heart. 